Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lauren Fordyce. I'm an American Association for the Advancement of Science, Science Technology Policy Fellow in the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research. This is our monthly BSSR lecture series. And this month, we're actually doing a webinar. So please excuse our figuring things out. Um, today, we are going to be joined by Dr. Tanya Lerman, who is the Watkins University professor in the anthropology department at Stanford University. Dr. Lerman studied social anthropology at Cambridge University, and her most recent book was entitled When God Talks Back, Understanding That Evangelical Relationship with God. She's also a, continu a continuing opinion writer for the New York Times. Her most recent work is a project funded by the National Institute of Mental Health which examines how life on the street, both chronically and or, or periodically homeless, contributes to the experience and morbidity of schizophrenia. Today she is going to talk about uh, culture and psychosis. And I just wanted to let you know that um, we will be collecting questions through the chat box. We're going to be muting everyone, so you can't ask questions uh, over the the vocal part, but we'll mute everyone. And then if you can type in your questions in the chat box, we will ask uh, her some of the questions at the, end. at the end. Okay, so I'm going to mute myself so Dr. Lerman can begin. Thanks. Hi, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you for, for uh, joining us. Uh, this is the first in this, whoops. Uh, sorry. Here we go. So this is the first in a series of illustrations of psychosis by people with psychosis. Um, I'm going to talk today on the role of culture in psychosis. And I'm going to talk about two issues. First, the culture within the world of persons with psychosis. And second, the role of culture in shaping the symptoms of psychosis. So let me begin with the first, um, uh, I'll first talk about the first. And I actually began with a practical problem, um, which is that people who can be diagnosed with serious psychotic disorder often refuse the help that's offered to them by mental health providers. So they'll refuse housing, they'll refuse medication, they'll come to the mental health services center and use the telephone but refuse to talk to somebody. And this apparent willingness to sabotage care can be extremely frustrating to uh, care providers. And it seems to contribute to this fundamentally nomadic life in which people client, people move between supported housing, jail, and the hospital, and the street. Kim Hopper talks about this as the inst institutional circuit. So the clinician's temptation is to say that people who could become who become homeless when they could get housing are suffering from a lack of insight. My work suggests that the story is more complicated, that the refusals are not only from a lack of insight, but that they're cultural expressions, that they are communications to actors within a particular social world, and that they have a meaning within the shared culture of the street. So the method of my field is participant observation um, or ethnography. It involves uh, spending a lot of time in the world that you're seeking to understand. And what you're trying to do to some limited extent, and of course this is impossible, you're trying to kind of go native, uh, to use that term, in, in this world, and, and then try to figure out what it would take to be a member of, of this community. It's, um, and I think that this method is kind of the best method to understand culture, which I take to be these complex, more or less shared, often partially articulated cognitive schemas that are that people use to understand their daily life and to communicate to others. So the basic question of my work um, in this domain um, was, is there a culture on the street, and in particular in those portions of the street where uh, the people who live these nomadic lives can be found. So this is the street corner at the center of my work in, uh, in Uptown in Chicago. And I should say that I did this work about 10 years ago for it stretched over a three or four year period. Um, the neighborhood has changed, I think. I now live in uh, California. Um, but I believe that the kinds of uh, patterns that I see 
uh, may resonate with other uh, communities like the one that I'm going to describe around the country. So my students and I did about a thousand hours of participant observation. I did um, much of the field work, but uh, this is one of my uh, one of my field subjects um, that I'm pictured with. I was joined by five students who did terrific work, um, and I had them do kind of an afternoon of work in the neighborhood for uh, about you know once a week for 20 weeks, and then I had them to do do more structured interviews. And all of them had at least limited, limited clinical training. Um, I trained them in the use of the SCID, and they had taken some courses on psychiatric diagnosis and mental illness. We worked in what's commonly described as a service ghetto. So this is a neighborhood in Chicago, often uh, described as uptown, often said to have the largest density of persons with serious psychotic disorder in the entire state of Illinois, outside of the jails. There are about um, 60 service air agencies of a variety of sorts in the in this neighborhood. It's a kind of cool area. It's a mixture of gracious mansions and tree-lined streets and uh, urban squalor. It was built as the theater district in the 1920s, and traces of that era still remain in this beautiful architecture that you still see around. Um, there are old theaters. There's a swing dance lounge uh, made once frequented by Al Capone and his men. This is a neighborhood that's full of big old hotels. They were built for the, the uh, entertainers, and they began to empty out in the 40s when uh, the entertainment business left to go out west or downtown. And uh, Uptown was then the last stop on the on the train. Um, to go down to the loop. And, it be, and these hotels began to be filled by these white-collar workers. Around the 50s and 60s, they fled to the suburbs. And the hotels emptied out, the architecture decayed, and this was just in time for deinstitutionalization. So the, as patients were released into the streets, they tended to end up in these uh, large hotels this became a scandal in the 70s. Uh, there were suicides, people, some people left out of the windows. Um, the hotels were in terrible shape. The city's response was to um, pour more money into maintaining the hotels, but um, basically left the patient population or the ex-patient population where, where it was. And certainly at the time that I was visiting, the place was packed with halfway houses and drop-in centers and addiction treatment centers and missionary outreach settings, state services, food pantries, and uh, supported housing. So these are the these old hotels. When I was there, you could stand on this street corner and see a thousand psychiatric beds. So the basic aim of our research was to understand the refusal of services. Um, many people would wander around this area and, you know, eat and sleep in the shelters, um, but refuse care. And so we based our work in a drop-in center in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, and basically, this is a drop-in center that required no diagnostic uh, label to entry. It was for women only. As long as you were a woman, you could come in and have a meal, use the shower, kind of hang out, talk to people. But what we did was to do uh, primarily participant observation. So I would hang out in Sarah's Circle, and I would go to the local coffee shops and spend time in the park and spend time in the shelters. Um, we also had the students do a formal representative sample of 60 subjects in our in the drop-in center. And at the end of the process, um, I sent a student back to do follow-up interviews with women I hadn't met to evaluate the um, kind of the inference that I, inferences that I was drawing from from the field work. So let me share with you some of the uh, data. So what we found from the formal subject was that these 
indeed were women in the institutional circuit. 40% of them had been homeless for more than six months. Over 55% had a history of psychiatric hospitalization. Over 55% had a history of arrest. 43% of them were currently living in shelters and um, 29% in these single room hotels, these SROs in these big hotels. 11% um, of them were uh, sleeping on the street um, or in the local shelter, were actually sleeping on the street. Uh, about a third of them were white, 45% African American. About 28% would say, said spontaneously that they had a diagnosis of um, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. But in this formal sample, you could infer from 78% a history of psychosis, either by looking at what they said or uh, their uh, disability status um, or from the way that they comported themselves in the interview. Uh, so many, many people in, in this, in this drop-in center and indeed in the neighborhood um, were uh, evidently psychotic. So this is the first in a series of portraits of women at the drop-in center done by a different graduate student. And the first thing to say is that um, we really saw people refusing services. So it was not uncommon to see a woman you know, walk into the drop-in center and say publicly, vocally, in a way that was kind of theatrically um, present for other people in the room, that she wasn't crazy. I'm not going to go to the Somerset House. That's for crazy people. Um, people were very clear that you could get housing if uh, if you were crazy. People would say things like this. You, and and, and these, these quotations, I should say, don't match the portraits, they, but they were said by um, women that, that I spent time with. You can get housing if you're crazy, addicted, or you've got a job. So it was pretty well known that if you had a psychiatric diagnosis, you could get, you could get um, housing. And what I inferred as the result of this work is that the word crazy had a meaning on the street or in this institutional circuit that it did not have in the white middle class world um, of the university and of the, um, and really of the service providers. And um, what I thought that this, this, the word meant, I thought it had three features that it evoked a kind of, or at least when people were using the word, it was consistent with these three features, that there was a social cause. People would say that the street will drive you crazy, that being on the street was sufficient to make somebody psychotic, that the condition was permanent. Uh, it's something that can't be fixed, and that not everybody on the street would become crazy. Um, people would talk about, you know, she's crazy now, you know, because you got up, because you gave up, that people became crazy because they were weak or because they gave up. And let me give you a feel for the way that through some of the, these quotations. So sometimes people would say, um, they'd point to somebody with flagrant psychosis. And they would they would kind of twirl their, their fingers around their, their heads to indicate crazy. She's been on the street too long, or permanent. Being crazy is something you absolutely cannot control. And a lot of them don't even take medication. They have retardation, and there's nothing about Alcoholism, you can do something. You can stop drinking. Nothing. You can stop, stop smoking. You can do those things and thereby reverse your situation, but somebody who appears mentally ill can't do that. And, and again, many of these women struggle with psychosis themselves. They're talking about other people. And of course, psychosis is a continuum. There's all, in a, in a neighborhood like this, there's always somebody who is more flagrantly ill than you are. Only the weak fall ill. There's a couple of girls come up here that talk to themselves. That's because they let the streets take over them. A lot of women have been raped by the men here. And those girls just can't deal with it. So that just makes them go go haywire. Only those who get, give up get sick. The street, it'll drive you to the brink of, it comes back to being mentally strong. I'm not going to let that happen to me. 
It happens because there are women in the shelter when they gave up. So in the follow-up interviews, we asked 21 women whether what other women in the neighborhood meant by the by the word crazy. And five of them gave answers that were recognizable in the psychiatric idiom. But fully 16 of the 21 gave answers that were uh that gave us their own opinion, um, a kind of dynamic model of psychosis in which the social experience of being on the street caused psychosis in those who were weak or who gave up. And the richness and the redundancies of these comments suggest that this kind of cognitive schema, this cultural model, is uh, easily accessible in this social world. And so in this setting, when women say that they're not crazy, they mean that they're not weak and they have not been defeated. So this is stigmatizing, but it's also important to recognize that it comes out of a particular social world. This is a world in which violence is uh, is common, but all the follow-up interviews spontaneously mentioned violence. A third of them spontaneously mentioned domestic violence or child sexual assault. The staff said that somebody came in beaten up once a week or more often. Um, I thought I often saw the signs of violence on women's bodies. So the women adopt a kind of aggressive style to get other people to, to back down. There's a, there was a freely verbalized kind of need for aggression. If you're going to survive, somebody told me, You've got to smack somebody down. This was also a profoundly isolated world, a world without a lot of so, a lot uh, without a lot of perceived social support. So these are our focal interviews of these 60 women. Over 40 percent of them said that they didn't feel connected to the women at Sarah's Circle, which is a, the name of this drop-in center. Two thirds of them couldn't name a single person that they regarded as a friend. When asked to describe their day, 40% reported no face to face interactions. This is quite stunning because these are people who are with other people all the time. They're often sleeping in rooms with 50 other women. They're on the street. They're standing in lines to get their food. They're sitting in Sarah's circle for, for five hours. There's a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. 40% of them reported none of it. When we, were at, when we asked them who they could turn to, 30% said no one. Meanwhile, there's a kind of tension between the toughness required of being on the street and the compliance required to get care. So service centers, shelters, often have um, long lists of rules. One of the shelters in the neighborhood um, you know, actually asks women to recite the rules out loud before they go to sleep. So you're there late in the evening, and the rules are things like, you know, don't wash below your neck at the sink. And all these women are able to, you know, recite together this long list of rules. Um, uh, Michael Hartman is, is asking, ask, asking for access to my shared applications. Do I approve this or decline it? Uh, I think I'm going to decline it. Oops, yes, sorry. Uh, decline it. Don't, don't uh, share anything. And you have us, uh, they have access all the access they need. <laughs> okay, excellent. All right. So we're back to the shelter. And I would say that the women themselves would... Um, articulate, verbally articulate, the conflict between the code of the street, the code, the code of street people it was sometimes called, and the code of what they would call decent people. And that tension, managing that tension, contribute to the, uh, the importance of what they would call being strong. So this is somebody who said, said to me, if, strong, if homelessness ever happens to them, they better have a strong heart and a strong mind. Because when they see everything, they're going to need a strong heart and a strong mind. If you're not strong-hearted, you can't take it out here. So strong had a, a, a set of meanings. 
One of them is just being tough. Being strong is like, I ain't getting hurt. It was also about inner toughness. One time I got raped and I had nowhere to go. I had to get right back out on the street and make some money so I could have a room for the night. I couldn't call the police. I called my mom in Minneapolis. I said, Mama, I'm going to do something I don't want to do. She said, what's that? I said, prostitution. She said, God bless you. Be careful. I'll pray for you. That's what my mama told me. A few minutes later, I had to wash up. So I washed up and I had to get right back out there and make some money. And that's part of being strong, too. So these twin themes of physical and mental toughness run throughout the interviews. The other clear meaning of being strong is that if you're strong, you're not crazy. I didn't think anything was wrong with his head because he was a strong man. I just thought he was a strong man. But it wouldn't but that wouldn't ever happen to him, you know. He would never be crazy. He would never be actually crazy because he was a strong minded person. Strong minded man. Strong so it wouldn't happen to him. But I was wrong because it did. What she's describing um, is a, an afternoon um, back in her house, when she had a house in Texas, when her husband uh, came into the room and sat down on the sofa and said, Honey, I love you, pulled out a revolver and shot his brains out. So what these women infer is that sur- to survive, you've got to be strong and not weak. And so nobody wants to be crazy. So people don't don't always refuse services, but there is this powerful cultural interpretation that says that if you admit to being crazy, you're saying that you're weak and you're vulnerable and you can be attacked. When you say you're not crazy, you're asserting that you're tough and you're strong and you're going to survive to get off the street. And it's important to note that these are plausible inferences to draw from a social setting. Again, there's always somebody in these settings who is flagrantly psychotic and more crazy than the person who is talking about being crazy. And they are right. They are surviving in a way that such a person is not. So paradoxically, what it means to be crazy in this setting comes to mean being beyond help, which is exactly the opposite of what most treatment providers and uh, mental health workers would mean to imply. So this has treatment implications. Um, The implications are that, at least in these settings, you should avoid diagnosis talk with clients. You should avoid requiring clients to to engage in diagnosis talk in order to uh, receive services. And um, one of the examples of the, uh, the, the programs that I think are, are effective are these housing first programs in which, you know, often, often supported housing asks people to participate in an explicit diagnosis and then there's a stepwise progression so that you only get guaranteed housing when you agree to participate in psychiatric care and, you know, give up your substances. Housing first just gives people housing. And there have been recent uh, randomized controlled trials that suggest that people stay housed for longer and are behaviorally more effective. And this work would suggest some reasons why that might be true. All right. So uh, one way of using ethnography is to look at the way people understand and uh, interpret and understand illness. Another way is to ask whether the illness experiences is uh, shaped by culture. This is a man praying for somebody else in Uptown. So I want to work on, now move on to the second part of uh, my talk, oh, rather more quickly than I had thought that I would be moving on. Um, I want to talk, uh, in the background here is the relationship between illness and, and disease. Um, that disease, and when anthropologists use this, this contrast, or thinking of disease as the organic malfunction, and illness as the experience of the disease. And what I want to suggest is that culture can shape the way people pay attention to their symptoms and change the experience of the symptoms themselves. So now I want to uh, present a study that I did um, with colleagues among persons with psychosis who hear voices. 
And so the, this is a uh, interview-driven study with 20 adults in San Mateo, California, Accra, Ghana, and uh, Chennai, India. And everybody, all the subjects meet criteria for schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. They're all voice hearers. They're all recruited through, through psychiatric hospital care. Um, so they're all, everyone around them knows that they're ill. I, I, I don't want to suggest that I'm telling a romantic story here. I'm going to tell us, give evidence that the voice hearing experience may be somewhat more benign in Ghana and in India, or at least with this sample. Um, but I want to be really clear that schizophrenia is a struggle no matter where you are, and that everybody within this sample recognizes that they have a problem and uh, is perceived by other people to have a problem as well. Let me just say as a background that the folks in San Mateo and in Chennai were pretty were pretty similar. They'd both been, you know, 20 years into that that held their diagnosis for many many years, um, and they were all either in supported in supported housing or they were in day treatment um, if they lived with their families. The subjects in Ghana are a little um, less. Uh, they, they were in the hospital. They were inpatients. And so they were a little younger, and they were a little more ill. Many, many of those patients, though, had been in the hospital for uh, for a long time and had made many visits to the hospital. Um, and I should say that we took as much care as we could to make sure that um, we were uh, not uh, that we were. Um, getting as, 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 as representative a description as, as we could. So I did all the interviews in San Mateo. Um, I've now talked to another, and with this interview, I've now talked to another 40 people in the United States. I did the initial set of 20 interviews in Accra with a Ghanaian research assistant. I then sent her in without me, and she did another 19 interviews, and we've talked to another 30 people in uh, Accra. My Tamil-speaking colleagues did, did the first interviews in Chennai. I came back, talked to five of their uh, five of their subjects, talked to, then to another 20 subjects, and we've since talked to 30 or 40 subjects. And so I feel reasonably confident of the the, the, the data that we're reporting. This is what the interview was about. Um, the interviews took roughly 30 to 60 minutes. Um, we asked about you know, what people heard, what they saw, what their experience was. We wanted to know whether they knew the person whose disembodied voice they could hear, whether they knew in the flesh the, the voice that they were hearing. We asked about their experience of control over the voices, what was most distressing, whether they had any positive experience, whether they had ever heard God speaking. And we talked to them about whether other people could hear these voices when they spoke and what caused the experience. And I'll only talk about a few features of uh, this, these experiences um, today. So this is a character, and I emphasize this is a caricature of the differences that, that we saw. That Americans hear horrible voices telling them that they're worthless and should die. That Africans hear an audible God who tells them to ignore the evil voices and that South Asians hear annoying relatives who tell them to get dressed and to clean up. And I should say that we presented these findings to a group of South Asian psychiatrists. And our experience was that the, the, the psychiatrist said, my goodness, what is wrong with those Americans? Okay, so let me share with you in more detail what, what we actually found in the interviews. Americans, very comfortable with diagnostic labels. They say things like I fit the textbook on, on schizophrenia. That's just, just their job, the psychiatrist, to give us labels and then give us medication. I have schizophrenia from my grandfather. It's a hereditary illness of the brain. They know I'm a schizophrenic. And so 17 out of the 20 spontaneously described themselves as diagnosed with schizophrenia. Every person uh, used diagnostic labels Many of them were comfortable with the idea of the um, uh, of the, the symptom checklist. I was actually doing uh, sort of this, this psychosis skid to uh, confirm the diagnosis because we didn't have access to their records. 
And um, people would say things like, oh, yeah, I've got all of those. Don't worry about that. This is my favorite comment. I went into the hospital with a little depression, and I must have caught all that other stuff on the way out. To Americans, hearing a voice means that you're crazy. That is the predominant meaning. It's something people said again and again. I didn't tell them I'm hearing voices. I was afraid I might be called crazy. You tell people out there you have voices. They treat you differently. I would say, do you talk about hearing voices to your family? No, we're not supposed to have mental illness. And I should say with these slides, these are all different people, comments from different people. In America, the voices are often unknown. So only three people um, reported knowing in the flesh the, uh, the, the people that, whose, voice, whose disembodied voice that they heard. In America, the voices are often violent. This is quite striking. Usually, it's like torturing people to take their eye out with a fork or cut somebody's head and drink their blood. Really nasty stuff. They want to take me to war with them. You're going to die. You're going to hell. My suicide voice. Why don't you end your life? Not one American said that their dominant voice hearing experience was positive. Now, I've since talked to Americans um, who have said that, but I would say much more representative is the comment from somebody I was talking to in, um, San, in the San Francisco General Hospital a couple of weeks ago who said, Positive voices, I, I'm sure I have them, I just don't pay attention to them. Um, Americans, when I spoke to them, wanted to dwell on the difficult, hard voices. Accra. This is a world in which hearing voices does not mean that you're crazy. This is a world with a highly salient idea of uh, about witchcraft, um, and in, in which even if you don't believe in witchcraft, you know that there are other people in your social world who believe that there are, um, who believe some people can have negative thoughts and those thoughts and feelings that can go out into the world and hurt somebody's body. There's this highly salient idea that um, people are in, are in a war between good and evil. And the idea of spiritual attack is an experience of that war. And so if we, you, people, that's how we actually would ask about the voice hearing experience. We'd start asking about spiritual attack and then move on to talk about voices. It, it, among this world, a group of 20 people, uh, there were more known voices than in the American sample. A nurse, a boyfriend, husband's brother or manager, relatives, neighbors, mother, siblings, boss. But what was really striking about this sample was that half, fully half the sample, so that means that half the sample did not report this, but half the sample insisted that their predominant or only experience was, was positive. And, uh, and really it was mostly the Christian God, although one, in one or two cases it was a non-Christian spirit. People would say things like, mostly the voices are good. They just tell me to do the right thing. If I hadn't had these voices, I would have been dead long ago. That's what's kept me alive till now. The voice is the voice of God I hear. And it was actually pretty difficult to get people to feel comfortable talking to me about their negative voice hearing experience. It would often take a little while into the interview, and some people just refused. Um, people would, would say sometimes that God told them not to pay attention to these experiences. Uh, sometimes I would have to, I would, Say so, you know, people, somebody was insisting that only their experience, their experiences were only good, and then I would say, well, you know, if you walk across the unit, do you find that a lot of people are muttering these mean things to you? Oh yes, God tells me not to pay attention. So that that was a striking feature of the way that people wanted to talk to me about their voice hearing experience. Here's an example. This is a, a woman whose experience was that she was cursed and raped by the people she stayed with. She began to see this snake that uh, sort of hissed at her, and it hissed at her and tormented her, gave her command hallucinations. And she was sort of in league with this merwoman who's this folkloric uh, Mama Wata kind of figure and uh, went on for months. Then this angel shows up, slices off the heads of the snake and the merwoman, now this woman told me that she only hears angels. 
they stand in the corner of their of her room. They fight with each other. They can be kind of noisy. But they're angels and they're good. She likes having them around. There's a quality in uh, these these interviews. It really felt that um, there was more of a quality of a relationship that these that the voices, even if they, um, well, in this in these two cases, that people knew in the flesh whose voice they were hearing. Um, and there was a, in one case, there's a woman who's uh, who developed this uh, very elaborate relationship with her boss. Her boss gave her good advice, talked to her a lot. She um, she had a constant ongoing relationship with him. She was very happy with it. Um, and in this other case, a woman heard her husband's brother and also her manager, and they would say these contradictory things. I love you. I want to kill you. But she insisted on describing these experiences as conversations. She referred to them as people, and she spoke about them as if they were relationships, not as not as assaults, which was a much more common quality, I thought, in the American transcripts or in the American interviews. Gemini. Over half the sample hears Kim. So some don't. Some hear God. Some hear um, distressing negative voices without content. But over half the sample heard Kim. Um, and most of the most of the Kim they knew in person. Some people um, heard uh, dead relatives, but typically they had. Typically, they also heard uh, living relatives or relatives who who, who they who they had known. Um, kin did what kin do. They command a patient to do domestic tasks, to go into the kitchen, prepare food. They also insist on good behavior. They tell people not to smoke, not to drink. That can be very annoying, but people would acknowledge that this was kind of good advice. At least eight people had positive voices. Um, so they would hear relatives, ancestors, famous people. People would say things like, I, I like my mother's voice. voices. Yes, I like it. It'll keep talking, which is enjoyable. I've derived happiness by thinking about him. I was struck by this. Um, I'm um, Many, many people talked about sex and masturbation. And for at least eight of the 20, it was a major theme. Um, so the voices would say out loud, you're a son, you're a gunda if you have masturbation. Uh, someone would get on a, onto a bus and they would hear somebody saying that they were telling everybody that um, he was masturbating. Um, so a young woman said that she heard a male voice, very vulgar, words all in raw, words in raw, I would cry, all very vulgar words. It seemed to me, or at least the invitation here, is to say that the um, and the Chennai voices were not devoid of violence, but the violence was such a striking theme in the American voice, in the American voice hearing experience. It seemed to me that the negative experiences in Chennai were more likely to be shaming somebody sexually in public. That was the experience of hearing these voices. One of the qualities in the Chennai voices that I didn't see in the Accra voices or the American voices was a kind of playfulness, uh, where people were really enjoying this as a kind of ongoing story or a film or an opportunity to hear the latest gossip. Um, the example I present here is a is a woman who heard Hanuman, who is the avatar who is um, represented as, as a monkey. And when she first heard Hanuman, he gave her these terrible commands, like to drink out of a toilet bowl. Uh, and now she has parties with him. So he has a, Hanuman has a child avatar and an, and an adult, and she kind of spends a lot of time with the baby Hanuman. She pinches his, bo his bottom, they throw streamers at each other. Um, she is very clear that her illness is a problem. She wished she did not have this problem. But when she sits in the bus to come to the day treatment hospital, um, the staff say that she's talking out loud, probably with Hanuman, and she seems to be having a great time. Why these differences? Well, I wanna, what I want to do is play you about 45 seconds of a track by Pat Deegan. And this is, of course, we think that voice hearing is uh, very is variable. 
people have a lot of different experiences. But, um, you know, people are very different from each other. But I think that we know that people may have more varied experience than they than they report. So Pat, Pat Deacon and her colleagues um, made this track to represent the voice hearing experience to yourself, hear his voices. This is about 45 seconds. Okay, so the reason to, to play that is to illustrate that there um, a, a, there may be a very a, a broad array of phenomena that people are experiencing: um, good voices, bad voices, commands, probably inside experiences and outside experiences, thought-like experiences and more auditory experiences, probably a wash of auditory and quasi-auditory stuff. And I think that. There's a process of selective attention that may shape the way people attend to these experiences and um, habituate their voice hearing patterns. And I think that particularly there are different ideas about mind and self which direct the way people pay attention. And in some broad sense, um, you could say that South Asia and Africa compared to the United States um, really privilege more interdependent social worlds. Americans value the sense of being different, being individuals um, that is less socially salient um, outside of the United States. And I would say that in these other parts of the world, the supernatural is more um, socially available. All the Americans um, I was speaking to, or almost all of them, were religious, but they didn't they didn't particularly talk about God, God speaking to them, whereas the supernatural is more kind of salient as an interpretation of these experiences in outside of the United States. In fact, if you look at the ethnographic literature, you would see striking differences in the way that people represent mental action and mental events. I think you can argue that in the United States, the mind is culturally yours, so the culture invites you to imagine uh, the mind as a thing that's private. Nobody else comes into your mind, that your thoughts are really important, but that they're not real. They're fundamentally different from the material world. Um, and I think that the experience of the mind being broken or that the thoughts being out, somehow one's thoughts being outside the mind is deeply distressing to the to folks in, in America. In Ghana, again, there's this idea of witchcraft. Even if you yourself as a Ghanaian don't believe in witchcraft, there's this highly salient invitation to uh, understand that some people think that some people have thoughts that can leave the mind and affect the world in a bad way. I think this may be playing a role in this intense hesitancy to um, acknowledge the negative experiences and attend to the positive experiences. Um, and oh, Sorry, I got another request. And in India, the ethnographic record is very clear that there's this highly elaborated idea of uh, the mind as a social process, that individuals make each other up. In fact, one scholar describes uh, South Asians not as individuals, but individuals, that somehow that the substance, that, uh, that you use each other's substance to kind of, to to to, to make who it is that you, you, you are. It's also this invitation to see that the mind is both a spiritual part and a human part, and somehow the mind connects to the spiritual world directly. I think the process that I see, I would call kindling. So this is a phrase that comes out of psychiatry. Kep Kreplin was the first to observe that people who became depressed probably needed less, um, less of a body blow in life to become depressed a second time. 
And I think that the um, that in, in effect the depressive response is becomes kindled. Um, that people are, have a habituated response to distress that comes depression. In the psychiatric literature, what you see is that there's this um, different cultural invitations shape the way symptoms are expressed so that you know, when people are depressed, typically they feel sad and their body also hurts. One of the things that um, Arthur Kleinman uh, pointed out is that in um, China, so in the United States, it's perfectly acceptable to go to a doctor with sadness as a presenting um, problem and to use sadness to generate care from other people and to stay home from, from work. That was unacceptable in the in China before the before the 1980s. Um, what particularly for agricultural workers, what legitimized um, care, what motivated care, justified staying home from work, um, took you to a psychiatrist was bodily was bodily illness. And Kleinman was able to to demonstrate that people who presented with a diagnosis of neurasthenia, which really attended to just describe the um, attenuated nerves and headaches and problems of the body um, could also be diagnosed as, as depression um, in that in in, uh, in that part of the world. I want to suggest that what we're seeing in psychosis is a story of cultural kindling, that there are what you might call affordances of the psychotic mind. So the Jim Gibson uses the word affordances to describe to the things that the world affords us to see that we don't always see and attend to. I think that there are many different kinds of experiences, quasi-auditory experiences that people encounter uh, during, uh, early, during psychosis, and that practices of selective attention shaped by the mind, shaped by local ideas about the mind, alter how those experiences are identified and may shape the way that they're experienced and may become a habituated interpretation of experience. So I wanted to take, okay, I'm going to take three minutes and just say a little bit about the evangelical charismatic Christians who are not psychotic, um, but to give you a sense of how powerful this American sensibility about disliking voices in the mind or in, in sort of voices from the mind in the world can be. So this is a world in which God is um, a person and he's mighty, he's beyond, beyond, but this is a theology in which people expect God to talk back in their mind. So when you come to a church like this, you're invited to um, experience the mind not as private, but the thoughts and images and sensations you might have understood as self-generated are actually God speaking. Here's an example. Somebody's explaining this. She says, when people are praying over me, I'm just receiving it, and all of a sudden I hear her go to Kansas, which is where her parents live. Because I was debating whether to go to Kansas, but I hadn't been thinking about it within a 24-hour period. It makes you want to say, where did that come from? And so recently I've been comparing um, charismatic Christian churches in the Bay Area, but also in Chennai and Accra, quite similar churches in many ways. They aspire to be modern and to teach people to be modern, and they share a similar theology that God will speak back in their mind. And I've been struck by the difference in the way that Americans talk about this experience. They are very clear, even in a church where they're meant to experience God in the mind, they repeatedly talk about this as weird and crazy. It's cra I, this is crazy, but I'm getting an image of something. You don't need to call the white coats for me. It blew my mind. You, might, you know, those people are tripping, you might say. You go, she's crazy. They talk, they do what I would call a double epistemological register. They have a thought, they have a thought and they will be ambivalent about whether this thought is from God or whether it's just a thought. You're not quite sure. It's kind of unreliable. You don't find either of those two features in the Chennai... Um, in the way that Chennai congregants or Accra con congregants talk about their experience, there's something really striking in this sharp, clear sense of a mind as a mind with unreliable thoughts in which voices in the mind or maybe a little outside of the mind mean that you're crazy. So I think that reinforces this sense that there really is something different about the American experience. Why do we care about this? And I think I have three more slides. Um, why do we care about this? 
Well, we know that the course and outcome of schizophrenia is more benign elsewhere. The best data come from India. We know that the harshness of voices contributes to poor outcome. I think this kind of work suggests that there are treatment implications. That um, I think it suggests that voice content may respond to learning. And I think many American mental health providers tend to imagine voices as, um, as, as, you know, as irrational. And so you shouldn't attend to them. You shouldn't encourage people to pay attention to their voices. There are a series of new treatments that invite people to engage with their voices, respond to their voices, think about their voices, talk about their voices. They're very different kinds of treatments, but they all share an emphasis in acknowledging voice meaning and respecting and engaging with the voices. And I think this work invites us to take these new treatments seriously and explore them as important um, as, as, as important tools to use uh, for people with psychosis. In conclusion, let me just say that I think culture matters in psychosis, that it can shape the social context of lived experience, it can shape symptoms content, it may have treatment implications, both for the way that we offer help to people and then the way that we manage voice hearing, that ethnography and qualitative methods are useful. And I would be remiss not to draw your attention to a forthcoming book um, that should come out in, in uh, September, in which I and a colleague put together a series of case studies in schizophrenia, and we talk about cultural variation in schizophrenia experience and uh, what lessons we can draw from it. So I'll end there. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lerman. That was great. Um, we have a couple questions that have come up over the chat box. I'm just going to scroll up here. Um, Someone wanted to know whether you know of any available data regarding the Hispanic population and their understanding of the psychotic mind. Uh, no, I think that um, a little bit. Um, uh, what is his name? Uh, Steve. Steve. Uh, there, there is a psychologist at UCLA whose first name is Steve. Um, who has done work on uh, schizophrenia in the Hispanic com community. Also Janice Jenkins, an anthropologist at UCSD. Um, but it's um, not, and I, I, my memory is that these uh, experiences are often assimilated to nervios and to experiences of anxiety. Steve Lopez, that's, that's the person. Thank you. I, someone just also reiterated that that was Steve Lopez. Um, another question is, do you have any thoughts on how multiple personality disorder comes into play with all of your research? Uh, great question. I think one of the big scientific questions that still reverberates around the domain of um, psychosis is the relationship between psychosis and dissociation. And there's some people like Richard Bentall who are um, fairly committed to the, to the idea that all, and the hearing voices movement, pretty committed to the view that all psychotic voice hearing is in fact a dissociative experience. And they would support that with the observation that trauma is closely associated with psychosis. So the more you know, people who report that they've been beaten up by life in a variety of ways are more likely to report, are more likely to develop psychosis. Um, I tend to differ. I think that the kinds of phenomena that you see in a religious setting where people are reporting uh, hearing God's voice and sometimes auditorily he hearing God's voice I think that those are experiences that are connected to dissociation. And I think that um, there's a difference, I think it's um, a different phenomenon for many people who are psychotic and voice hearing. And so there's a big difference between the clinical population and the, and the non-clinical population with these auditory experiences. 
Um, but I also believe that within the clinical population, there is a, you know, what I, how can I defend this? Um, I think there's a different feel to many of the phenomena that seem more dissociative and many of the phenomena that seem more psychotic. Um, we're doing some work now to see if we can tease apart um, the, the patterns of these symptoms and the way people phenomenologically describe them. Um, at the same time, it's pretty darn clear that even if there is a bodily difference between psychotic process and dissociative process, which is, at, of course, at the heart of multiple personality disorder, a lot of people live in the gray area. And many people who meet criteria for psychosis might also meet criteria for a multiple personality disorder um, and, or for dissociative identity disorder. And sometimes I'm talking to somebody who has been diagnosed with schizophrenia and their experience just feels more dissociative than um, the experience of other people. There's more richness. There's more of, of a kind of a whole narrative frame for the experience. Um, so I don't know. It, it, it's a big question. Thank you. Um, another sort of question building on your first question is if you could address the ethnic racial makeup of the American sample you interviewed and whether you think that had any effect on what you saw in their comments to you. So uh, I can't retrieve the, the exact figures. Um, I would say that um, this is a blunt impression and I don't... Um, I don't think I could. I don't think I could publish this yet, but I would say, really, based more on my in, recent interviews in San Francisco General Hospital, um, and also based on my time in Uptown, I think that um, African Americans may be more comfortable with the symptoms and more uncomfortable with diagnosis. And in my completely anecdotal experience. Um, the people who reported to me, the Americans who reported to me recently that they had positive experiences with their voice hearing were all African American. Okay, um, and we have one more question that's been submitted. What do you think of the concept of expressed emotion? Is it useful? Yes, um, I think that there is an evidence that it is quite useful. I think there's also evidence that it is um, culturally variable and that um, you don't know, really know um, that, there's, that, that it's the meaning of the way that people express distress rather than the um, than of people who are around the person with schizophrenia, the meaning of their criticism rather than the criticism itself that is costly. Janice Jenkins, again, has written written about this. Um, one of my students, John Eliason, uh, makes the argument, and this pops up in this, this book and these case studies in schizophrenia, that, um, so, John Eliason went off to study the African Caribbean community in London which, as you may know, has a the risk of schizophrenia may run as high as 15 times as high as in the local white population. And there's uh, many people who have been uh, curious about why, why that is the case. One of the things that Joanne Eliason pointed out is that people in this community are often pretty isolated. And she thought that in general, she uses the concept of community expressed emotion to describe the high levels of anger and distress in the community directed at many members of the community, um, which she takes to signal uh, their discomfort in living in that social world, um, and which she thought contributed to the risk of schizophrenia. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lerman. Um, we're going to end this now. For those of you who joined us partway through, 
The recording will be available on our website once it's been made compliant for all ADA needs. So you guys can go back and watch anything that you missed. And so I just want to thank you so much to all of you for joining. And thanks again, Dr. Lerman, for your fascinating talk today. Thank you. It was a pleasure.